for we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, His mercy has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the Word, I announce the grace of God to all of you, and in the stead and by the command of Christ declare to you that your sins are forgiven in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to His people on earth.
Might be my turn. I should have checked the list. The Old Testament lesson from Genesis chapter 9, beginning at the 8th verse. This alone, the gospel lesson, will serve as text for our meditation. We are on just the other side of the flood at this moment in this text. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you. As many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the entire earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle lesson is from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at the 14th verse. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And he continues the prayer, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all fullness of God. And he closes the prayer, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power of work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. We honor Jesus Christ by rising for the reading of the gospel as we sing the Alleluia verse. Sega while he dismissed the crowd. And the crowd is the 5,000 men and women that have just been fed the children. When he began, after, he had taken, after they had taken their leave, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. But they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them, and he said, Take heart, it is I, don't be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret. 
and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. Wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might just touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Welcome, Miss Laura, who has a children's message for us. Well, hello, but this time, Rebecca, Elisha, and I are going to come forward for the children's message. If there's any other children, I don't think there are. That's okay, because I have another one watching, which is very exciting for me on Saturday evening. If you know, you're here a lot. Okay, hello. How are you doing? Good, good. We had the most awesome week at PBS, wouldn't you say? I had so much fun. I'm a little bit tired now. Are you a little bit tired now? Never. Okay, good for you. We talk a lot about Jesus' power. And when we talked about Jesus' power, we said something like, Jesus' power helps us do hard things. And then we went like this and we said something. Here, driver, trust Jesus. Yes, that's what we said. We said that a lot. After every Bible point, we would say, trust Jesus. And we sang a song that had this motion in it where we said, we trust, we trust, we trust in Jesus. We talked about trust a lot. And we talked about how trust is believing that somebody is going to do what they say they're going to do. Now, the word trust actually helps us understand what it means when it comes to Jesus. So I have the word right here. And trust starts with a t t t And it ends with a t t t Do you see anything in this room that kind of looks like a T? Yeah, what is it? <gasps> the cross. The cross kind of looks like a T, doesn't it? Okay. A lowercase T. Yes. So I printed a lowercase. T. Okay. So that means that trust starts with the T and ends with the T. Starts with the cross and ends with the cross. Starts with Jesus, ends with Jesus. Now, let's just pretend that the R and the S aren't there for children's message purposes. What is this letter that is in the middle of trust? This letter. You. You are in the middle of trust. And you are surrounded by Jesus. You have Jesus on your left and Jesus on your right. And that means that we can trust that he is going to be everywhere we go. If you go this way, Jesus is there. If you go this way, Jesus is there. Either way this view goes, there's Jesus. That means that you can trust that Jesus is going to be ahead of you. He knows what's going to happen to you and he is going to take care of you. And he knows what you've done and he forgives you for all the things that you've done and he has loved you. As you grew up from when you were a baby until now, he's loved you then. And we can trust that all those things that happened before, like 2,000 years ago, when Jesus got on that cross, T, and when he died, we can trust that that is true. And we can trust that everything to come that Jesus said, that he's going to come back and that he's going to bring us to heaven. So as you look at the word trust, whenever you see the word trust from here on out in your life, look at that you in the middle and say, hey, good for you. Remember, I am in the middle. You is in the middle. So round you by Jesus on both sides. On both sides. Can you please hold your hand? Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth and doing what you said you do so we can trust you always thanks for being everywhere we go to our right and our left in our future and our past and in everything we do 
We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay, now, unlike a regular <coughs> children's message, we're not going to go back to our seat yet. We're going to give everybody a little bit of a taste of some of the music that we sang. Do you remember what song we're going to sing right now? Do you remember? Do you remember? We're so excited. Woo! You all might know this song. <clears throat> you can join us. Sure. You all might know this song. It's this train is bound for gold. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Jesus made a place in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Jesus made a place in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory. Jesus made a place in heaven for me. This train is bound for glory. This train. You can sit right there for a second. Right before we go back, I also want to do something else. If you helped with VBS in any capacity, <clears throat> meaning group leading, station leading, meal doing, uh, supply gathering, um, anything, you know who you are, will you please stand up? These wonderful people gave up their time and their energy this summer to help make PBS possible and gave a lot of kids a really great time and they learned about Jesus and they loved it. You're all so wonderful. Can we please thank God for you? Thank God for you and uh, yeah, you're wonderful. You can sit back down. Thanks for all that you do. We really appreciate you. All right, let's go back to this. Yeah, thank you. We continue with the hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is the Old Testament and Gospel lessons that you heard a moment ago as we consider the covenant promises and confidence that we have in those covenant promises. In the time of Noah, <clears throat> the world had become so wicked that one day God said, I'm going to flush the whole thing down the drain. That's how seriously God regards sin. The sin that had come to fill his entire creation. After more than a year inside the ark, when it had finally run aground, and the land had become dry, God brought Noah and his family out, and they were certainly grateful for having been delivered, because, well, no one else was there. But if they're going through something like that, <clears throat> how are they going to go on? After witnessing the wages of sin with their own eyes, watching water fall from the heavens for 40 days and 40 nights, water that killed everything <clears throat> and everyone, the only world they had ever known. How could they go on living without anything except fear every day? Wouldn't every passing rain cloud from that point on bring with it crippling fear? <clears throat> A boatload of anxiety? Wouldn't every falling drop of water <coughs> remind them of divine judgment? If Noah and his family and their descendants, including you and me, ever wanted to live in peace, they need some kind of assurance. They need a promise. <clears throat> and the promise was the Old Testament text that you heard read just a moment ago. It's really simple. You see, a rainbow. Light meets water. And God's covenant was visible. They had a picture just when the light met the water. The covenant was seen. It's worth noting <clears throat> that this covenant is not some kind of an agreement. It's not a deal. It's completely one-sided. God declared it all by himself alone, and God's going to carry it out all by himself alone. God alone is accountable for keeping his covenant. So what Noah and his family got is better than a good deal. Better than a negotiated contract. It's God's very own visible, unbreakable promise that he'll never destroy the entire planet with a flood again. And so they and their descendants would not have to live in fear every time a storm cloud came or every time it rained. Now join me by fast-forwarding to the Gospel reading today. As God did to Noah, Jesus has ordered his disciples into the boat. Hey, Noah, in the boat. Hey, disciples, in the boat. <clears throat> now when the wind and the rain came at the fourth watch of the night, it wasn't a worldwide flood by any means, but it didn't need to be. It was still enough wind and enough water and enough rain to sink them in their boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. So, if ever there was a time to see a rainbow, that would have been it, right then and there. Except it isn't. You see, you only get rainbows when light and water meet. It's the fourth half watch of the night. There's no light. No light in the fourth watch. There's only the darkness and the fury of the storm. And it's so fierce that in that storm, <clears throat> even the sight of Jesus is little consolation to those disciples at that moment. The sight of Jesus gives the disciples no relief because they still don't know Jesus. 
They didn't understand what the feeding of the 5,000 was all about from last week, if you were here last, last Sunday, last weekend. And their hearts were hardened about the whole thing. That's how it's, it, it's possible that in the middle of a deadly storm, they can actually, at least for a second, to be so terrified of even Jesus, too, walking on the water and coming by the boat. Without the faith to see Jesus for who he is, may as well have been a ghost. Nevertheless, Jesus tells them, take heart, don't worry, stop being afraid. In a word, Jesus is saying, have a little faith here, guys. Have some faith. But they don't have that right at that moment. They don't believe him. They don't believe in him at that moment. And so they go on in fear, even after the storm stops. That last part's really important, even after the storm stops. <clears throat> if Noah and his family didn't believe God, they have no peace. Even when staring directly at the bow in the sky, they have, they have no peace. His promise, physical, that they could see in all of its colors. The same goes for the disciples. Without faith, they remain in fear, <clears throat> even while looking Jesus right in the face, in the boat with So where does that leave you sitting here today? There are parts of your life that are windy. There's parts of your life that are stormy. But you're not sure what's going to happen next. There are parts of your life that are dark. They're dark with sin. There are parts of your life that are just dark with the circumstance of it's nighttime. And so even now, in the middle of the mid-Atlantic sun, right here where we live, you too may be afraid. Afraid for yourself. Afraid for your parents. Afraid for your children. And what kind of world are we turning over to them in the next generation, the next 20 years? Afraid for your church. Afraid for this local congregation. In the face of all that, would it really be helpful if I said to you, well, just take a look at a rainbow. <clears throat> That's all you got to do. Just take a look at a rainbow. That would be, you know, greeting card Christianity at best for some people. That's about as good as it would be. That is unless you see the rainbow the way God intended when he drew it out in the sky. You see, according to his word, that bow in the clouds was put there to represent for you a promise. One that comes by grace as a gift from outside of you that you have no control of. What's more is that the bow stands between God, the Father, and His creation. It's placed between God, the Father, and you. And so, the rainbow points to Jesus. Not simply because, like Jesus, it stands between you and God's judgment, but because it actually points upward. You notice, you really don't look down to see a rainbow. You look upward. And usually, you don't see the whole thing. You see it as a break. And the break points up. <clears throat> Interesting. If you look from the other side of what you think is a whole, the break points up. Interesting. Interesting. As a warrior hangs up his bow, after a battle. So also God, when he set his bow in the sky, pointed it upward. He pointed it upward because when the time came again to deal with sin, and to deal with it once and for all, we're sick of this. We're just going to wipe it. I'm tired of it. You just hear God now saying it. His aim would not be to set on you, but to instead set it on his only son. The arrow of divine judgment was aimed straight into the heart of heaven. Right at Jesus. God alone made the covenant. And God alone would keep it. And in doing that, 
in making that promise, in making good on that promise, God moved far beyond his justice. Everything that God has done to save has been out of pure, fatherly, divine goodness and mercy. It would have been in perfect keeping with all of God's judgment to let Noah and his family perish in the flood, because they were sinners too. It would be fair to let the disciples sink in the storm, because they're sinners too. And it would be just to let you live in fear, and then let you die in your sin, game over, how sad, too bad, off to hell you go. But, God is always more merciful than he is just. And that mercy is only made known and always made known in the person of Jesus, God's only begotten Son. The mercy pointed to by the rainbow is delivered and made known only in Christ. God could have easily put a rainbow over the water in the midst of the storm, even at night, but he didn't. There was no rainbow that night. There didn't need to be a rainbow that night. Treading on the water was the light of the world. Climbing in the boat was the light of the world. Shining in the darkness was God's promise, God's new covenant, God's Son, here for you. It's too much to believe. And some people would say, yeah, think about it. You could never muster such faith completely on your own. So it's been given to you for free by the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Noah. Like Noah's family. You've been through the flood. Like them, pretty much, you've seen and received God's great and powerful mercy as you went through the flood. You receive that mercy there in the font where Christ, the very Word, and the light of the world met the water. There, the promise of God was applied to you once and for all. There, sin was drowned, and a new creation sprang forth onto firm ground. Imagine that. The light of Christ and the water formed God's bow over you. So when storms rage, and they do, and they will, and some of them are physical storms, you know, heavy rain, thunder, lightning, and all of that. And some are the other storms of life. My child is in the hospital. I just arrested my teenager with drugs. What do I do now? Oh, the car won't start. It died in the middle of the highway. I can't even get out. When little storms and big ones, like our house caught fire. And where do we go now? When the storms, whatever their size may be, when death and hell assail you, where is your promise? Where will you look for it? It's not, it is not in the sky, but where light and water meet for you. God's unbreakable promise was delivered to you in your baptism. And as sure as Christ is raised from the dead, that promise remains sure and it comes directly to you. Not merely that the world isn't going to perish in another flood, but that whatever comes, whatever comes, there are floods, promises already, that's not coming. All the other stuff that comes, God's Christ remains with you. You are not alone all the way to an eternal place where there are no storms. For you have been crucified with Christ and you have been raised with Him eternally. And so nothing, no nothing can separate you from the love of God that is yours in Christ Jesus. In His love, from His mercy, from His salvation, no sin, no storm, no sickness, no darkness, no death, nothing. Where's your promise? It's not only in your baptism, but it's in the scripture. 
Where is your promise? It's not only in your baptism in the scripture. It's in that holy meal that we celebrate and have so often. Whenever you come to that precious meal, whenever you come, and come to it as often as it's available to you. Amen. And amen. We continue our worship time together as we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I invite you to rise. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and the third day he rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We speak our mission statement, our God-given mission is to connect people with Jesus. You think about some of those people right now, because in a moment we'll have a chance to add their name to the many that are being called out in this church and all over the world. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Eternal Father, O oh God, our Creator and Redeemer, we thank you that you have drawn us to yourself by the power of your Word and our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For your promises of life and salvation, we give you praise and adoration as our God and Lord. Keep us in steady faith in you. Guide our steps in the ways of your life-giving Word. Make us to be evermore your people of hope love, and life. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord Jesus, as you strengthen your early apostles by your very presence, so give strength and courage to church workers who continue in your service to this day. Guard and protect them from the assaults of the devil. Bless their service in your word and sacraments. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, give your blessing and guidance to all in authority and the service of government in our land and throughout the world. Cause them to pursue righteousness and justice in all their dealings, that we may live in prosperity and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Yes, sir. Continue to bless those in celebration and give healing and comfort, O oh Lord, to all who are in trouble, danger, or illness, especially those we've carried on our hearts who we now name aloud before you. Sustain their courage. Keep them in faith, in your mighty care. Lord, in your mercy. Hear your your hands, O Lord, we commend all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Um, you may be seated. Our ushers are going to use the offering plates here in the back. They're going to come down the aisle, come across, and they're going to receive the gifts, and then bring them forward to receive a blessing on the God. Offerings of tithes and offerings that you are going to need today. We continue with the reception of the gifts.
you is peace. Amen. You can please be seated for just a moment yet. A few announcements and a special word to you about Christian education. Vacation Bible School, as you heard earlier, big thanks to all the people who are involved. And in a way, all of you are involved because your gifts help us to pull this together. Uh, we, we don't ask the families who participate for a registration fee. We put together so, there's so many pieces that come and move in this. A lot to do this on a regular budget. So thank you for your gifts, for your contribution of time, for all of the things you've done to make this work. Our Southeastern District has in the past had a conference at the end of July. It's traded by a number of names. Its purpose is to equip all people, not just the workers in the church, but the workers in the church. You know who the workers in the church are? All of us. It's not just like in the pastors and DCs. It's everybody. Everybody. This year, by the title BINGO, and that's an acronym for Being Intentional Neighbors in Gospel Outreach. We're doing this online as a summer conference this Thursday and Friday, and it's from 7 to 9 in the evening. So it's not high enough all day, all day, all day. This year, what we've done is I'm going to make it available in the fellowship hall right here. So you can register online for our Southeast District if you care to. And those of you that are on joining us live stream, if you're not near the church and you care to come, you'd be very welcome. Just go to the Southeast District website register. Or drive up here and join others from Redeem and from the community that may choose to come. Both nights, 7 to 9 p.m., downstairs in the fellowship. Next week, the LWML receives mics. They do that every month. That's the, the offerings of all funding that they do multiplied. Turns into $2 million of gifts every two years internationally along with what happens at districts and even in local society. It's amazing. And finally, there's a, a new music opportunity for all people, but particularly, uh, well, I shouldn't say all people, young, K-12, that we're calling I've Got Rhythm. And it's a choral opportunity with uh, rhythm and music starting on August 14th at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary. That's when the first rehearsal will take place. You'll see a little more in the newsletter, a little more uh, on screens. We'll be chatting about it a bit more. Look for it. Finally, I'd like to invite up uh, Ms. Laura, who's going to bring us word about the Sunday School Ministry, what's coming in the next days ahead, before we sing our closing. Thank
peace serve the Lord, you are free. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.